In lesson four, we talked about male and female understandings. When you watch spirit science, you have two choices in how you understand it. You can come from the left brain, take notes and carefully see the logic in each step. Or you can come from the right brain, just let go and don't think, feel. Watch it like a movie, expanded, not contracted. Either way, it will work. My advice is to try and see both angles if possible. It is through balance that spiritual health returns. Whichever way you take it in, the fact that you are watching is what matters. And what you receive is what you were meant to receive. Today's lesson will be separated into three parts. First, we're going to talk about existence of extraterrestrial life. Then we're going to take a look at human life before recorded history. And finally end with why things are happening on Earth today. Part 1. The Dogon Tribe, Sirius B, and Dolphins. There is an African tribe near Timbuktu called the Dogons who hold information that would be absolutely impossible to know according to today's standards. See, the Dogons have a cave on their land that stretches back into a mountain, and in this cave are drawings over 700 years old. Now, the brightest star in the sky to us is called Sirius, now called Sirius A. If you look at Orion's belt, following it downwards to your left, you can see it. The information in the Dogon cave specifically showed the star Sirius. They are very specific about the star, and they have a diagram of not just Sirius rotational pattern, but a small star orbiting it. They say it's very, very old and very small, and made out of the heaviest matter in the universe. They also say that it takes close to 50 years for this small star to rotate Sirius. Astronomers were able to validate the existence of the secondary star, now called Sirius B, in 1862, and only about 30 years ago could they validate the rest of this information. The way that stars work, when they get really old, they have two options. They can go supernova, or it can blow up as a red giant, cause an explosion, and slowly collapse into a white dwarf. Sirius B is a white dwarf, which corresponds with what the Dogons say. White dwarfs are the smallest star type, estimated to weigh approximately 1.5 million tons per cubic inch. Black holes aside, that would surely seem to be the heaviest matter in the universe, or at least incredibly close. The Dogons were right on every aspect. Not only that, but when checking the rotational pattern of Sirius B around the larger star, Sirius A, they found it to be 50.1 years. Now, this could not be a coincidence at all. It's just too close, too factual. Yet, how did an ancient primitive tribe know such detailed information about a star that could really only be measured in the last 30 years? And that's not all they knew. They also knew about the other planets in their solar system, including Uranus, Neptune, and Pluto. They knew exactly what these planets looked like when you approach them from space, let alone from Earth. They knew about red and white blood cells and had all kinds of physiological information about the human body. All of this from a primitive tribe. Naturally, a team of scientists went to the Dogons and asked how they knew all this. This was probably a mistake to these researchers because if they accepted that the Dogons really have this information, then by default, they must accept how they got it. The Dogons told them that a drawing on the cave wall showed them. The drawings show a flying saucer in its familiar shape coming out of the sky and landing on three legs. Then it shows the beings in the ship going into water and coming up to the edge of the water. These beings looked very much like dolphins. In fact, maybe they were dolphins, but we don't really know for certain. Then they started communicating with the Dogons. They described where they came from and gave the Dogon tribe the information. Here's another thing the Dogons knew. This little drawing was on the walls, but the scientists didn't know what the heck it was until computers calculated the orbits of Sirius A and B. As seen from Earth, this pattern shown in the cave is identical to the pattern of Sirius B moving around Sirius A in a time frame between the years 1912 and 1990. These two times are actually kind of important. 1912 was the first year when we began communication with the Greys, and in 1990, a specific electromagnetic grid around the planet was formed. But we'll have to look at that later once we go over some other stuff first. Another thing about this rotation, it's the exact same rotational movement of DNA. Part two, how old is the Sphinx? This is probably one of the most important discoveries on the planet ever. The first one to really discover this was R.A. Schwaller de Lubitz. He is a famous Egyptian archeologist who has written many books. He and his stepdaughter, Lucy Lamy, have demonstrated a profound understanding of sacred geometry and Egyptian culture. Now, on the Sphinx, there are wear and cut patterns that are totally different from the patterns on other buildings in Egypt. Toward the back of the Sphinx, there are cuts 12 feet deep into the surface. This pattern appears to be smoothed by water, as opposed to all the other buildings and structures built by Egyptians, which are only textured by sand and wind. The last time that there was water in the Egypt area was over 12,000 years ago, at the end of the last ice age. Scientists have determined that after the ice age, the Sphinx took a heavy beating, after which it was encased in sand for about 8,000 years. The face, however, was above the sand and continued to be weathered. The Egyptians didn't build the Sphinx, they merely restored it. Of course, Egyptologists have been slow to adapt to this new incredible discovery, but I think we know why. See, there are around 5,000 Egyptian archeologists in the world and they all pretty much agree with each other in most ways. They make little changes, but not too many, and most agree on the age of the pyramids. All of these archeologists are Muslim, with a few exceptions, and their holy book is the Quran. 
Please understand that I'm not trying to discredit a major religion, but the Quran says that creation began about 6,000 years ago. So if a Muslim were to say that the building is 8,000 years old, he would be disputing their Bible. They cannot do that. And so they won't even talk about it. Another thing that's actually incredibly interesting, the Sphinx has a body like this and a head like this. That's rather unproportional, isn't it? Not only that, but the Sphinx is actually facing a very specific direction. It is an astronomical marker. The Sphinx is in the shape of a lion. If it were built when Egyptologists say it was, that would be only 2,500 years ago, while the constellation of Taurus was in the sky. The only logical time for the Sphinx to be built when it was, was when the constellation Leo was in the sky, during the 11th millennia BC. The time that matches exactly where our new findings say that it would have been built. In the past, when something new like this was discovered that has a major influence on the viewpoint of the world, it takes about 100 years for it to get to the average person to say, oh yes, that's true. But this time, it's happening a lot quicker because of the internet. Now scientific circles are actually beginning to look at the words of Plato in a new light when he talked about another culture, another continent, from a dim past called Atlantis. The Sphinx is the largest sculpture on the planet. We know it was not done by hairy barbarians, but by a very sophisticated culture. And it was not done by anybody we now know here on Earth. From a scientific point of view, this is the first solid evidence to be accepted about the true age of civilization. There have been lots of other evidence, but it has kept being put under the table. Now we have the accepted evidence that there absolutely had to be someone on earth who was highly civilized as early as 10,000 years ago. This is just the beginning of how we are going to completely change our view of who we think we are. Part three, Earth's relations to the cosmos. We are living in accelerated times. Remember in lesson one, I said time is speeding up? Let's talk more about that. The following is a fact according to Encyclopedia Britannica. From the time of our oldest known civilization, the ancient Sumerians, around 3800 BC, Continuing for almost 6,000 years up to about 1900, a certain number of information was collected. Let's say for simplicity's sake, that in that time we learned one bag of facts. 50 years later, from 1900 to 1950, our knowledge doubled. That means it took 6,000 years to get a bag of facts. And in 50 years, we got another one. Amazing. But then in the next 20 years, we doubled it again. And then in 10 years, we doubled that. And now we're getting bags of facts every month, maybe within days, I don't even know. The fact is, things are speeding up monumentally. We're living within a knowledge avalanche. Life on this planet is accelerating faster and faster, obviously culminating in something new and something different, perhaps just out of the reach of our normal imagination. What does this mean for the world? Why is it happening? Better yet, why is it happening now? Why didn't it happen a thousand years ago? Or why didn't it wait to happen a hundred or a thousand or 10,000 years from now? It's really important to understand the answer to this question, because if you don't know why this is happening now, then you'll probably not understand what's happening to you in your life or be prepared for the coming changes. Now, the Earth actually has a wobble. Well, it has many wobbles, but the one I'd like to talk about today is the one called the precession of the equinox. Essentially, what this is, is a rotation that the planet does, which completes a cycle once every 26,000 years. It looks like this and slowly turns on its axis and points to different locations. Science looks at this and says, well, so what? It's just a wobble. But by looking at what the ancient civilizations knew, you see a more complete image. The point actually points to and away from the center of the galaxy. The center of the galaxy is where most of the energy and the most consciousness is. It's not just light up there, you know? So in this diagram is our rotation. Here's the tip pointing towards the center of the galaxy, and here's the farthest pointing away. The ancient Sanskrit writings that also talks about this procession call this going with the galactic wind. The Sanskrit writings say that there are two very important places on this wobble. One is at A and one is at C, not the very tips as you might think. There are also important places at D and B, but not as important as A and C. According to these ancient writings, as we hit position A, we begin waking up. And as we hit position C, we begin to fall asleep. We continue on the cycle, but every time we make a full rotation, we wake up more and more. It works the exact same way as day and night on earth. You go through this cycle every day, waking and sleeping, but every day you become a little more conscious. You learn new things. You don't do the same things over and over. I wanna talk about religion for a bit because you can definitely see this wobble over recorded human history. See, when we were the ancient Egyptians, Sumerians and Mayans and such, we were incredibly wise. We may not have known all of the advanced intricacies of the world that we do now, but we knew about the procession of the equinox and we had an advanced geometric understanding of the universe that we're gonna talk about soon. Then we got dumber and became all philosophical, not quite knowing anymore, but still able to understand many things. This is where things like the Fibonacci sequence and pi and the golden ratio were discovered. And then we got dumber still, and it was around this time that we had a real solid formation of most of today's religions. But you have to remember that these religions were based on earlier writings. They were written by people who understood far more than they did. They just couldn't make sense of it. And that's why many Bible stories just seem ridiculous. Ultimately though, every religion did spawn from a more conscious understanding. So you can't discredit religions completely. You just have to trace them back a bit further. You'll also see looking back that we went from a more female oriented understanding to an incredibly male way of looking at things, very strict and orderly, not much room for creative thought. It has to be 100% logic oriented. 
Back to procession. The Tibetans and Hindus also had these time periods called yugas, which were simply ages. Each yuga had a descending and ascending phase. Many of those who follow new age beliefs will tell you that we're moving into the age of Aquarius, but not many people know what that means. Well, we're right here on the procession of the equinox, just about at point A. Remember, this is a really important time for us, not just humans, but all of Earth and perhaps maybe our solar system. This is a chart showing the precession scale with our constellations. The astronomical sign that we see in the sky when we hit point A will be that of Aquarius. Are you ready for this, the big finisher? Can you guess when we're going to hit point A exactly? The Mayans figured it out. <laughs> yep. Take me 